sure Mrs. Barber can um, can introduce her or yourself. All right. Sure. All right. So good evening. My name is Carly, and I'd like to welcome you to today's program sponsored by G1 Therapeutics. Please note all audio lines will be muted throughout the program. Before we begin, let me cover a few conference details. Um, you may enter your question at any time during the presentation by typing them directly into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can also enter them in the chat box below. And if you guys would like to um, ask any questions verbally, I will unmute you guys um, and I'll make you guys as panelists so you can do so as well. Um, and I would suggest to just wait for the end of the presentation to verbally ask any questions, um, but it's totally up to Mrs. Barber. And now uh, Tanya or Mrs. Barber can take it away with the introduction. So thank you so much, Carly. My name is Tanya and along with my colleague, um, Darlene Burns, Behringer Engelheim and G1 Therapeutics, would like to welcome you to the Triangle ONS presentation for May. So a quick uh, thank you. I know we had some technical issues that may have impacted the program. So uh, Akshat, thank you so much for helping get the wheels back on here. Tonight's topic, Cosella, a novel myeloprotection therapy, will be presented by um, someone who probably needs very little introduction. Um, so we are going to, on her request, abbreviate it. Uh, she is currently the Oncology Pharmacy Residence Program Director, as well as the Director of Oncology Pharmacy Programs and a clinical pharmacist practitioner at Duke University Medical Center. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Sally Barber. Thank you. Thank you for keeping that short and sweet. <laughs> so um, welcome everyone. Um, this will probably also be short and sweet, but I'm here tonight to share um, information about a new drug um, called Cosella or Trilocyclib, which was approved not too long ago um, to be used um, uh, in patients who are receiving um, platinum-based therapy or topotecan uh, regimens for extensive stage small cell um, lung cancer. So uh, we'll start off with just a, I'm just going to briefly um, go over some of these warnings and precautions because we'll talk about more of them later. Um, Cosella is an IV drug. So as um, such, it, it um, act, does have some risk for injection site reactions. Um, this can include phlebitis or thrombophlebitis. Um, it occurred in about 21% of patients that had received um, Cosella in the clinical trials. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about it um, later, but obviously if patients were to experience any sort of injection site reactions, um, it's something that we would, you know, stop infusion and, and treat the patient. Um, and then depending on what the, that reaction was, um, proceed. Likewise, um, a small percentage of patients, 6% of those patients um, that received this in the clinical trials did experience hypersensitivity reactions. So again, likewise, um, we would treat um, these hypersensitivity reactions the same way um, we would treat hypersensitivity reactions for any other drugs and stopping the infusion, um, um, you know, uh, appropriately um, taking care of that patient. And then um, again, depending on the reaction, um, the grade of the reaction, um, either restart or permanently discontinue. There is a small um, risk of interstitial lung disease and pneumonitis. So important to just make sure that when we're talking to patients, they're aware of this risk. And um, this is an agent that should not be given to patients who are pregnant. So again, just stressing that importance of um, making sure patients are being appropriately educated and that um, contraception is being um, utilized. So again, we'll talk a little bit more about the detail, but adverse reactions occurred in about 30% of, patient, of patients who did receive the drug. Um, there were 5% of these reactions did, um, were fatal. And you can see um, what those reactions were. So pneumonia, respiratory failure, um, hemoptysis, and a cerebrovascular event. Um, whenever learning about a new drug, I'm always interested to know, um, did these adverse events um, affect how a patient was able to continue the drug? Were they able to continue it? So you can see that um, the uh, adverse events were, did not frequently lead to the need to discontinue the drug or to interrupt the drug. Um, drug discontinuation occurred in 9% of patients and interruptions um, were four per, just slightly over 4%. 
Um, most common adverse reactions were things like fatigue, some lab abnormalities, um, and, and headache. Um, as a pharmacist, we're always looking at drug interactions. So there is the potential for drug interactions um, with Cosella. Um, however, um, I think when you look at what that, how the, um, uh, what Cosella inhibits, it's, it doesn't affect a lot of the drugs that we're using in our patient population, but it is, as with all drugs, important to, to check with your, um, for any potential um, drug interactions. So um, this is just briefly the agenda for this evening. So we'll talk um, about um, chemotherapy-induced myelosuppression, the mechanism of action of this drug, the data that led to its approval, Again, go into a little bit more detail about the warnings and precautions, and then the um, nitty gritty of how you dose it, how you give it, and then what um, resources are available to help with patients. So as you all know, as um, nurses who are working in this um, with chemotherapy-induced myelosuppression is one of the main um, toxicities of just about every chemotherapy that we give to patients. Um, the hematopoietic stem cells are susceptible to um, damage from the chemotherapy, which results um, in myelosuppression. And the proliferation of these hematopoietic stem cells are dependent on CDK4 and 6. Um, we, we have drugs available to help with this, but these are drugs that, as you know, we use after we've given chemotherapy. So the growth factors that we have available that target um, the prevention, uh, you know, target neutropenia, um, like um, growth factors, um, the filgrastim type drugs. And then we have ESAs, which are addressing the um, uh, anemia and uh, red blood cells. But all of these are um, two things. One, they're reactive. So they're given after the damage has done to try to help patients recover. And they're only specific to whatever lineage they're targeting. So either neutrophils or erythrocytes. So there is an opportunity, obviously, to maybe, um, you know, um, have an effect earlier on in that, um, in that downstream. So this is just a review of what the current uh, guidelines, both NCCN and ASCO have guidelines to help guide the use of the uh, growth factors that we currently have available. So um, the ESAs, I'll start on the right, because the ESAs, um, we don't actually use those a whole lot anymore for a variety of reasons, but they are still an option in, in um, the appropriate um, patient. Uh, growth factors that are um, targeting neutrophils are used in a variety of different ways. So the recommendations for primary prophylaxis, so um, are we use those with cycle one for, for patients who are receiving a regimen that has at least a 20% risk of febrile neutropenia, or they might be used in patients whose risk is more intermediate between 10 and 20%, but have um, one or more risk factors that, that make their risk of febrile neutropenia higher. So that's primary prophylaxis. Then we use them in the secondary prophylaxis setting. So if a patient didn't meet the criteria to use it up front, they get their chemotherapy, they develop febrile neutropenia, um, then um, the consideration of adding growth factor is, is appropriate. Um, and then um, while not the primary um, use of these drugs, there is, um, they are occasionally used in patients um, to treat uh, neutropenia. So uh, if patients have, um, uh, have febrile neutropenia, um, they didn't receive any growth factor and they have again, some additional um, risk factors, you will occasionally see um, growth factor added um, you know, in that mid cycle, they already are neutropenic, have febrile neutropenia and growth factor will be added. But the primary um, role is really in that primary or secondary prophylaxis um, setting. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the drug is, is approved in patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer. So when we look, when we look at that specific um, disease state, and the chemotherapy regimens that we typically use, um, those, are, those are listed here. So um, in the first line setting, as uh, you all know, we, the first line setting recommendations are a combination of um, platinum and etoposide with atezolizumab or dervalumab, um, or 
um, before we were adding the atezolizumab and dervalumab, it was just platinum um, and etoposide. So those are the three um, regimens where this uh, drug can be used. And then while there are a variety of drugs um, approved in the second line setting, this is approved to be used with um, topotecan. And then you can see there are a variety of drugs that are approved in the um, uh, beyond the, that second line um, setting. So lots of choices in the second line setting. And when we look at um, the incidence of, of myelosuppression with the drugs that, that were um, the regimens that we're talking about in that first line setting, so a newly diagnosed patient receiving um, just platinum antitoposide, neutropenia uh, occurs 25 to 48% of uh, in per, 25 to 48% of patients and anemia 12 to 20%. Looking at first line platinum, etoposide and IO, similar because we know that IO doesn't totally, you know, doesn't really add a whole lot. Um, Topotecan, uh, neutropenia is 54% and anemia 31%. Um, we know topotecan um, does have a pretty good risk of febrile neutropenia. So, um, looking at the, the disease states and the chemotherapy, you know, this is a um, area where um, prevention of myelosuppression um, has the potential to be um, beneficial. And again, as you know, um, you know, these are patients where we're really trying, you know, they're not curable. So we're trying to prolong survival, palliate their symptoms and provide the best um, quality of life that we can. Um, so myelosuppression, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as we all know, it's one of the most common dose limiting um, side effects of chemotherapy. Um, in patients who develop profound myelosuppression, it affects their ability to receive their therapy, um, causes dose delays, causes um, uh, therapies uh, needing to have their doses reduced. They can, obviously, if they develop febrile neutropenia, we know that's a, um, you know, an, a, a life-threatening complication that can be fatal. Um, and so if we're, if we're not able to uh, give patients therapy, there is that potential um, to compromise, you know, outcomes. So um, the other thing is that they, there was a survey of patients uh, done and from the patient, you know, end of things, they, 88% um, of patients in this survey reported that myelosuppression had some sort of impact on their life. And there's a lot of data um, uh, out there with regards to anemia and neutropenia and how it negatively impacts a patient's qual quality of, of life. And again, as we mentioned earlier, the strategies that we currently have to address myelosuppression are um, reactive. So after the damage is already done, we're trying to just speed speed up recovery and um, and uh, you know try to get patients counts to recover more more quickly. Um, and then and then again, you know, growth factors are used, and as I mentioned, ESAs. <laughs> used to just be used a ton. And then obviously they're not used a lot um, these days because of the variety of black box warnings, the risk um, and um, how they're currently recommended to be used and um, that potential increased risk of mortality and growth factors. Um, their use is, is in many institutions, you know, very regulated, um, uh, followed by guidelines and, um, you know, there are, there are limitations with how those drugs are able to be used as well. So Cosella or trilocyclib or trila, as some people will call it, um, is the first and only myeloprotective therapy. So it was approved a couple of months ago, and it's indicated to decrease the incidence of myelosuppression. So all lineages um, in patients um, who have received it prior to their platinum etoposide regimen or again, their topotecan containing regimen. So it is an IV drug. It is a uh, selective, uh, potent and transient, which is important inhibitor of the CDK4-6, um, uh, CDK4-6. And so what it has been shown to do is to reduce um, some of the consequences that are then, you know, the downstream effects of having um, myelosuppression. And we'll look at, again, some of those. So some of you may be familiar or recognize CDK4-6. There are oral drugs that are, that, um, are oral CDK4-6 
four six inhibitors that are used in the breast cancer space. So this is this is different. So this just sort of shows the difference in indication and how it's given and sort of how they work. So again, this drug, I've mentioned what its indication is the oral um, CDK4-6 inhibitors are used for uh, in the metastatic breast cancer setting. They're oral, they're chronically administered um, either once or twice a day, depending on which drug. And this is an IV drug that's given every 30 minutes and it's given every day before chemotherapy. So depending on the regimen that the patient is receiving, this is administered at least um, within a four hour time period before they're getting their chemotherapy. And as I mentioned, the mechanism of this, this is transient. So that's important. This transient, this transiently arrests the hematopoietic stem cells in the G1 phase of the cell cycle. And if you're like me and you need graphics, that'll be next. So I think it's helpful to sort of see, whereas the oral ones um, uh, inhibit that um, proliferation. And you can just see here the half-life and the bioavailability um, of the IV versus the oral drugs. So this is just um, a nice uh, graphic depiction of how the drug works. So again, you can see there in the red, that's the G1 phase and um, Cosella or trilocyclib, it arrests um, transiently the hematopoietic stem cells in that G1 in that G1 phase. So it sort of protects them. They they're arrested there, and then um, because it's transient, once that you know once it wears off, it then allows um, you know the, them to go continue to go through the cycle. But that that arrest while the chemotherapy is sort of on board allows them to then be um, protected while the chemotherapy um, is being administered. So again, it's a new mechanism. Um, again, this is you know a different depiction of the different cell lineages. And I think if you just think about the drugs that we currently have available and you know giving patients platelets and giving patients transfusions, those are um, towards the end of the road here. You know, it's after the damage is done. Growth factors are um, working a little bit sooner, but not a whole lot sooner. And I think the the big difference here is that this is working you know, um, in that very, very early um, stages of blood cell development and really protecting those before the chemotherapy has the opportunity to um, have its effect and damage the cells. So there are three studies that we're going to um, briefly look at, and I'll outline the three studies, and then we'll kind of look at the results all together. So this was the pivotal study. This was the study looking at um, at administration of Cosella in patients receiving etoposide, carboplatin, and atezolizumab. Um, so it was a double-blind placebo-controlled phase two study. There were 107 patients. They had extensive stage small cell. They had um, a performance status of at least zero to two, and they um, uh, had no symptomatic brain mats. And then, and as in every clinical trial, they had to have, you know, decent organ function. So they received the standard carbo, um, etoposide, atezolizumab chemotherapy, and they received um, the Costella dosed at 240 milligrams per meter squared or placebo um, all day. So on day one, they received the carbo, the etoposide, the atezolizumab, and Costella or placebo. Days two and three, they get, I mean, etoposide and um, the Casella or placebo. And then um, after, um, uh, after the you know, cycles of combination, you know, they go on to maintenance a, a tesalizumab just like we do. Um, important thing to note that uh, primary prophylaxis of growth factors was not allowed in cycle one to allow to see the effect. They were allowed you know, and administered per the, per the ASCO guidelines, but not in cycle one. Um, Patients were allowed to receive any necessary supportive care transfusions um, as needed. And then the primary endpoint is uh, the percentage of patients who developed severe neutropenia. So as a reminder, that's an ANC less than 500 and the duration of that severe neutropenia in cycle one. So focusing on cycle one, um, a variety of different um, secondary endpoints, looking at transfusions, um, the, the need uh, of growth factor administration, um, and also looking at um, dose reductions of, of chemotherapy. And then uh, study two is looking at patients who 
uh, just received a topicide and carboplatin. So this was also a double blind um, study. This was an earlier phase study, so more proof of concept, smaller number of patients, um, same uh, inclusion criteria, you know, extensive stage small cell, um, good organ function, same chemotherapy, carboplatin and nictoposide, but no IO in this um, earlier study. Um, and then again, patients receiving Cosella or placebo prior to their chemotherapy each day. Similarly, they were allowed growth factor, but not in cycle one um, and any necessary supportive care. Because this is an earlier, you know, it's the phase one B2 study, there weren't specific endpoints, but they were looking at a variety of different um, um, efficacy objectives, safety, tolerability really being the focus. And then the third study is looking at the role of um, Cosella in patients receiving topotecan. So um, again, a randomized uh, placebo controlled phase two study, 61 patients. And, and again, topotecan is approved in the second line setting. So these are patients who had, had progressed um, uh, after first line or second uh, first line or second line therapy, um, good organ function, again, performance status of zero to two. And the, the dose they gave the, um, the uh, Tobitecan for five days, which is the recommended um, uh, regimen for small cell lung cancer. And again, similarly, growth factors um, not allowed in cycle one, supportive care as needed. And that set those same two primary endpoints as in the first study, looking at um, uh, percentage and duration of severe neutropenia. And again, then also looking at need for transfusion and uh, growth factor. So these are the three studies, all looking at them together with regards to the baseline characteristics of the patients um, that were on the study. You can see that in general, the median age was somewhere in the mid 60s. Um, ECOG performance, even though patients were allowed to be um, ECOG performance status of two, in all the majority of patients were either a zero or one. Um, uh, smattering of different um, levels of smoking history, pretty much all had some smoking history, but um, some roughly split between a form, being a former smoker and current smoker, which is typical in um, our lung cancer population. So looking at that first study, so this is the study looking at Cosella in the patients receiving um, platinum etoposide and uh, atezo. Um, again, that primary endpoint was severe, severe neutropenia. So in the patients who received placebo, uh, severe neutropenia uh, occurred in 49%. And in those who received Cosella, it was um, 2%. So significant um, difference there with regards to uh, um, severe neutropenia. And then um, also that duration was shorter in the patients who received um, uh, Casella. And then looking at some of the secondary endpoints, uh, incidence of febrile neutropenia, um, growth factor administration, uh, um, uh, grade three and four, um, decreases in hemoglobin, uh, transfusions, and administration of ESA all were um, better or lower, depending on what you're looking at in the patients who received, um, who received Cosella. So, um, you know, supporting the benefit um, of administering this drug. And then this is the study two, the smaller proof of concept study looking at um, patients who were just receiving carboplatin and etoposide. Um, and again, this one didn't um, have preset sort of um, endpoints, but looking at the similar things, you can see the incidence of grade four severe neutropenia was significantly lower in those patients receiving um, Casella um, growth factor administration, incidence of febrile neutropenia, those same things also um, uh, better in the patients who received Cosella, statistically significant in some, um, in some instances. And then in the Topotecan study, um, again, we see that uh, we're, it had the same primary endpoint of looking at uh, um, the incidence, the percentage of grade four um, severe neutropenia. So you can see it went from 76%, um, a difference uh, down to 41% in those that received the 
um, study drug compared to those that received placebo. And again, the duration of that severe neutropenia was, um, was uh, less in the patients who received casella compared to those who received placebo. And then uh, same secondary endpoints as in the previous two slides, um, incidence of febrile neutropenia, less the um, need to add growth factor, less um, uh, decrease in hemoglobin, uh, um, less incidence of grade three and four, um, and the need for transfusions and adding um, ESAs was less um, in those patients that received Casella. And then um, one of the other things that, you know, we've talked about is the um, impact that myelosuppression has on chemotherapy dose reductions. So that was also something that was looked at in all three studies. And in the um, first study, which was the pivotal study, you can see carboplatin was, um, re uh, had to be reduced in only 2% compared to 25% of those that received placebo and the etoposide dose um, was reduced in 6% of patients compared to 26%. So a, um, a big reduction there. And then again, in the, uh, the um, other two studies, same. You know. So overall, um, the inclusion of Cosella um, led to a, um, a reduction in the need to reduce the dose of chemotherapy in these, in these patients. Um, and then in this other table is just looking again across, um, looking at sort of more of an event rate. So it's the same story. You can see that um, that in patients that received Costella, uh, the need to um, to dose reduce was significantly less in in those patients. So we're going to sort of shift gears a little bit back to some of the um, warnings and precautions that I mentioned at the beginning. So. Um, especially um, for you uh, guys who are nurses and at the bedside with patients, injection site reactions are something um, that we're seeing. It occurred in 21% of patients, but, um, uh, but you can see that only 0.4% of those were grade three. So these were the majority of these were, um, you know, uh, lower grade. Um, so that's good, you know, good, meaning that, you know, they're ones that you can, um, you know, manage. So again, just making sure the patients are being appropriately monitored and that if um, it is a patient who um, were to have a more significant um, reaction that, that the infusion has stopped and it, and it is um, discontinued. And as we do with all patients when we're giving them chemotherapy, certainly if they were to notice something, you know, after the fact, um, after their infusion is done, certainly make sure they're letting us know. And then hypersensitivity reactions, again, only 6% and none of those were grade three and four. So the majority of them being um, mild, um, there was only one patient that, that had grade two. So again, just making sure patients are appropriately educated and that, um, and that um, you know, we're keeping an, an eye on them when these infusions are going on so that if they were to have a reaction that, that we're able to um, quickly address. Um, stop the infusion and address um, the needs of the patient. Uh, I mentioned um, interstitial lung disease and pneumonitis, very um, low likelihood, but um, just important, especially in the lung cancer population, that they're aware of this risk and that they're um, reporting any changes in any sort of pulmonary symptoms, cough, dyspnea, um, at, uh, back, to their, back to their providers. Rare, but certainly if this is something to occur, um, um, you know, can be significant. So we want to make sure that they're aware. And then again, these are just looking at all the other um, adverse reactions that, that we're seeing. So I mentioned fatigue being the most common. Um, other lab abnormalities like hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, um, headache, um, other ones just to, to um, monitor. Oh, wow, really went forward a whole lot there. Sorry, um, but you can see in the placebo, I mean, you see the same thing. So um, similar, um, not a whole lot of difference in the frequency um, between the, um, the patients that receive placebo. These are just some other um, uh, looking specifically at the hematologic adverse reactions in the patient population. So as we've, you know, sort of going along with what we've already 
um, looked at with the results of the study, neutropenia was less than the patients that received um, Cosella, febrile neutropenia was less. And this is sort of looking at um, all the studies together. Um, anemia less, thrombocytopenia less. So um, proving the concept of this being a myeloprotective um, agent. So in terms of how the drug is given, so I think I've mentioned many times, it's an IV drug. It's dosed at 240 milligrams per meter squared. It's administered over 30 minutes and it will be given um, within four hours prior to chemotherapy. Um, it is um, given over 30 minutes. Don't give it all at once. Um, it, will, it will come, it can be reconstituted and diluted um, diluted in either D5 or normal saline after it's been reconstituted. Um, it needs an inline filter. It should not be administered with other drugs. Um, so it needs to be administered in its own line. And then once it's been infused, um, it needs to be flushed. Um, with regards to um, um, the timing with regards to chemotherapy, as I mentioned, it's given four hours before. There, there are no specific recommendations with regards to whether it needs to be given before or after the antiemetics that are given every day. So it's really, you know, um, will be however um, your site maybe builds their template and recommends that it be given. Um, one of the things that's important to understand is that um, the drug with re it's, is with regards to if a patient either misses their treatment or um, treatment is gonna be discontinued. So if a patient misses, a, misses their treatment, they like don't show up or the Casella dose is missed for some reason, you don't wanna give the chemotherapy if the intent is that both drugs are gonna you know, be continued. So if someone doesn't come one day, they don't get their Casella, they don't, they're, they're also not gonna get their chemotherapy and you need to wait um, to resume um, the next day. So um, if the Casella dose is missed, you don't give the chemotherapy without it. So let's say somebody had a reaction or something. And so you're not going to give this Cristela. You're also not going to give the chemotherapy. You need to wait to give them together. So you would wait until the next day. If the Cristela is going to be discontinued. So say you were on day two of Topo Tecan, Cristela, they had a reaction or something, and you're not going to give the Cristela anymore. You have to wait 96 hours from that last dose of Casella before you continue on with whatever's remaining of the chemotherapy. And that really is, goes back to the mechanism of action and you need to allow those cells to, you know, sort of come um, out of that arrest and sort of get back into their normal, normal cycles before you can give just the chemotherapy alone if you're gonna give it. So if you're discontinuing everything, you gotta wait 96 hours. If they just missed the one for whatever reason, you can you can resume the next um, scheduled day of chemotherapy. Um, dose modifications, um, with regards to adverse reactions, there aren't dose modifications um, recommended for patients with hepatic, um, you know, any sort of mild hepatic impairment. So um, there are specific instructions in the package insert if there were need to um, dose uh, modify. I mentioned dose interactions, is is something just to be aware of, um, but pretty um, minimal risk with regards to the um, what most of our patients are on. But again, important to always um, check if you if you don't use it for some you know for whatever reason, um, you are able to store it um, up to twelve hours at room temperature or four to eight hours um, um, if it's already diluted in the bag. Um, this is not something that should be refrigerated. Um, so all things that should um, be clear on the label when it comes from the pharmacy. And then the last thing is really um, just to mention this G1 to 1 patient support program. So um, they do have, you know, all the typical support that is um, that we would expect um, for these patients. They will help um, verify benefits. They will help with um, payment coverage. They will help with OS. They will help with, you know, all of those um, things though, you know, there's lots of helpful information on the um, website as well with regards to information about the drug and um, 
any financial help um, and education as well. So there's lots of um, support available um, for patients. So again, just in summary, so Costella or Trilocyclib or Trila, um, it's the first and only um, multi-lineage myeloprotective therapy. So again, it's, it's um, working um, before damage from chemotherapy um, has occurred. It works to help protect all um, lineages. Um, it is selective, it's potent, and most importantly, transient. Um, and again, the, the indication is there. And it, it's, it's important to keep in mind that it is only approved in this specific um, uh, um, disease state and with these specific regimens. Um, so, so that's how it's, that's how it's, that's how it's approved. So with platinum etoposide containing regimens or topotecan retaining, uh, containing regimen in patients with extensive stage small cell lung cancer, given over 30 minutes within four hours of chemotherapy each, um, each day. And as evidenced by the trials that we went over it, it has been shown to, um, reduce, uh, myelosuppression, not only myelosuppression, but some of the complications that are associated um, with myelosuppression. Um, important just to make sure patients are educated to some of the potential um, risks, such as injection reactions, um, hypersensitivity, and uh, of course, obviously, some of the adverse reactions um, that may um, occur with this drug on top of their chemotherapy. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. If anybody has any questions, um, I could promote you guys to panelists to ask verbally. Um, if not, then you guys can write in the Q&A box or the chat box. And if nobody has any questions, I think that we are good to go. Uh, I, I, do, I do have a question. Sure. Um, why is it only used in extensive stage small cell lung cancer? Um, that's, that's the only, um, that's where it's currently approved. That's where it's been studied. You know, as, as you saw, CDK46, um, you know, has a different role in other cancers. And so it's important it's uh, important to make sure that uh, some other cancers might rely on CDK4-6. So at this, at this um, time, that's the only way, uh, um, disease in which it's been approved. You know, with any of these supportive care agents, you wanna make sure that you're not, um, you're not causing any adverse, of, adverse consequences with the cancer itself. And so at this point, and, and I know, and I'm sure they're studying it in other, um, in other areas, but at this point, as a myeloprotective, it's only approved in extensive stage small cell. But I'm just curious, though, why not small cell just earlier? It, ha it hasn't been studied in, um, in limited stage disease. So mm -hmm. that's, at this point, that's the only, um, it's only been approved in extensive stage. Okay. You know, with, with these, with, it's just with, with growth factors, with all these protective, you know, they're, they always start in the extensive stage and then they might back it up, but they, they um, want to make sure they're protecting the stem cells and not protecting the cancer.
All right, does anybody else have any other questions? I was just gonna jump on and say thank you. Uh, thank you, Sally, for a great presentation. And um, and again, thank you, Akshat, for, um, for joining us. Absolutely, and so, thank uh, you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Sally, and thank you to the uh, two, two attendees that are left and to all the attendees. <laughs> um, all right, I think we're good to go here, right? No more questions? No. All right, awesome. All right, well, you guys have a great night. Thanks. Bye. See you Thank next you so time. Much. Thanks so much. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.